Hey, I'm Roy Harriman with Stratagos International here with Vaughn Baker, our president, and welcome to another edition of Stratagos Security Week here on Facebook Live. We thank you for watching and we welcome your comments and questions uh, throughout our broadcast here. Um, I want to introduce uh, the topic for today, and that is we're looking at YouTube and you overcoming the odds to stop workplace violence. There are a couple events that we're going to reference. One is the shooting at the YouTube headquarters, which received a great deal of publicity earlier this month. If you can't remember the details or you don't know them, a woman, not an employee, but a consumer and a customer of YouTube, uh, shot and wounded three people, three employees, before uh, taking her own life. Um, less than a year ago, in the same general uh, region in California, a major UPS center was hit, uh, attacked by a U.S. Uh, by a UPS employee uh, who simply strolled into the building and, and began shooting. So, Vaughn, let's start with an overview question. When it comes to workplace violence, what are some things we can control and what are some things we can't? Well, one of the questions that we get asked frequently is uh, what, what training or what strategies can we put in place to prevent these from occurring? And uh, first of all, I want to say that, that there is no guarantee that it, you, it will not happen And as far as preventing it. And the example we give is when you think about the billions and perhaps even billions of dollars that are spent protecting the president and the hundreds and thousands of people that are assigned to protect the president, we still have fence jumpers at the White, White House and even one fence jumper made it into the White House and uh, still have attempts on the president's life and Ronald Reagan, six rounds, 1.6 seconds and George Bush, two size 10 shoes. So first of all, prevention is not the expectation. However, there are many opportunities to prevent incidents from occurring. So well, that, that's really, I want to cue up the show with is, is letting people know that there's no guarantee and no strategy that's going to prevent everything from occurring. But by training our folks and by putting preparedness strategies in, we create opportunities for, to prevent more opportunities to prevent through awareness. Now that's a, that's a, an excellent point is uh, there, there is no um, on this side of heaven, there's no program that can prevent anyone from uh, attempting uh, something radical. The examples of the presidency are, are uh, uh, perfect, uh, perfect uh, uh, anecdotes. Um, so when we look, drill down a little bit uh, regarding uh, the YouTube shooting and then uh, uh, about nine months before that, the shooting at the large UPS distribution center in this also in California, um, we referenced an article from the San Francisco Chronicle. They went back and visited the UPS distribution center after the YouTube shooting. And the article says that since that shooting at UPS, they changed security companies and added metal detectors and bag checks. But it's essentially an open facility. It's a distribution center with trucks coming and going in and out all the time. Uh, so one driver interviewed for the article said, said this, he says, look at this giant door. We've got four of them and they're designed to be big and open. Um, you can't make that airtight. Um, so it sounds like he has a point, but what can be done? Well, that's just an example uh, of uh, a facility. And we tell people when we work with clients initially is one of the things we do first is identify what their culture and their core mission is, because it would be easy for us to come in and turn you into a prison, turn your organization into a prison. But that's really not realistic, nor is it desired. So uh, there's always going to be opportunities. What we're trying to do is create a layers of either awareness or layers of access and have some sort of controlled access process. And uh, we use that with technology, with processes and with protocols uh, to have controlled access. The other thing we think about when we're controlling access uh, is uh, let's look at the data and let the data drive the decision. Well, the data says that over 80% of these workplace violence attacks are committed by somebody who already has access. It's an insider, uh, somebody who already works there or has recently been terminated. Maybe their act or their key card or their pro proximity control card has not been deactivated yet. So, or they piggyback inside the facility. So uh, I understand what their, their point was as far as putting uh, metal detectors in and maybe changing security companies and protocols. But even with metal detectors, one of the things we say is that's not going to prevent attacks from occurring. Uh, it'll just change the point at which the attack starts. 
for uh, the example, of this is the Family Research Center in Washington, D.C. Uh, the attack started at the metal detector when the, uh, the ideological attacker was trying to make entry into that facility to attack people within the Family Research Council a few years back. Uh, he handed the security guard his bag of Chick-fil-A uh, sandwiches, and then as soon as he took it from him, he produced a weapon and began to shoot while well, the security guard heroically was able to stop that. So uh, again, the expectation that we can put these processes in place and prevent situations uh, is not realistic. Uh, however, it does provide opportunities to mitigate and respond properly, which will drastically and significantly reduce loss of life and injury. So that's really what we're, what we're talking about and what we're after. No, that's an excellent point regarding the metal detector. That's just where the attack uh, started. And if you're joining us uh, just now, we welcome you to Stratego Security Week. And I'm Roy Harriman with Stratego's President Vaughn Baker. And we welcome your questions and your comments regarding workplace violence, which is our topic today. And if you receive value from uh, watching the show, we encourage you to share it. And we appreciate it if you do. Vaughn, one thing you mentioned, just to follow up on your previous answer, you mentioned uh, layers. Um, and of course, you mentioned the fact that 80% roughly of these kind of attacks uh, are perpetrated by people who are already insiders. But could you give us an idea of what some examples of layers might be? Well, layers could be access control as far as uh, uh, we're keeping our, our exterior door shut and we're funneling visitors through a particular location. The same could be true. Maybe we have a different location that we funnel uh, employees through. If you have a lot of employees, maybe you narrow that down to two or three points, at which we uh, make sure people go through the screening process, whatever we identify that we, that we want that screening process to be. Uh, so that would be an example of a layer. Maybe a, for an outsider threat, we have a perimeter fence uh, to prevent people from even getting into our parking lot. I can think of one of our clients, they have a fence and you cannot come inside their parking lot even uh, unless you uh, talk to an intercom box and talk to security and state what your business is there. So that would be an example of a layer as well. If God forbid the attack does begin, what we're trying to do from a response portion is create layers uh, to prevent access from the attacker getting to our particular location. So we have layers within a, even our room. So we, we talk about locking down our room, but not trusting just a locked door alone. Uh, we say lock layer and reinforce. And so we're going to create redundancy to our lockdown. So when we talk about layers, it can be either focused on prevention access control uh, from a prevention point of view or in the response phase as well. Excellent. And uh, I wanted to uh, highlight a comment uh, from one of our viewers here, Tyson Kilby. Thank you very much for your kind words. Stratagos is the best in the business in this topic. Thank you. We're humbled. Awesome. <laughs> Vaughn, thank I want to uh, go right ahead. I was just going to thank Tyson as well. That's right. Vaughn, I wanted to um, bring up a topic again. This is coming from uh, the article uh, that looked at the UPS shooting nine months later. And one of the uh, security consultants that uh, interviewed for the article said, um, you can build a six foot fence, but for every six foot fence, there's an eight foot ladder. And so that would tell me, again, echoing what you're saying, that um, it's more than uh, mechanisms and uh, tactical elements that are put in place. What role does employee awareness uh, and employee education play uh, in preventing workplace violence? Well, by educating our employees on what to look for, we know that almost all bad acts are preceded by bad body language and bad behavior, usually over days, weeks, and even months. Uh, so we want to educate not only uh, supervisors, but employees on what behavior indicators to look for from coworkers or maybe even a customer. If a customer is making veiled or direct threats and and maybe they sent multiple emails over a period of time and they became becoming even more irrational uh, what to look for. Uh, we help organizations all the time doing behavior assessments with a person they may be concerned about. And we, we, we attempt to, uh, to measure risk when we're talking about a particular person and we gather a lot of information on a person to do that. So uh, educating our, our employees on what to look for. Now we got more sets of eyes that know what to look for from a behavior point of view. And, and then once they identify behavior that is concerning to them, they need to know what to do with that information and how to share that information, whether they feel comfortable sharing it in person or over an email, or if they want to share that in an anonymous format. 
many people aren't comfortable because they don't want to become a target themselves and sharing information. So it's important that we provide an anonymous capability for people to report information as well. So that's really what we're referring to there when we talk about uh, awareness and preventing. What we're trying to do is create opportunities to prevent by educating people. Vaughn, as you interact with uh, uh, businesses and other organizations, how well is this being practiced? Uh, you know, are, are people simply rolling the dice and hoping nothing bad happens? Is there, is there a lot of room to grow in terms of educating employees and cultivating a culture of awareness? Well, we are seeing more and more organizations that are educating their folks on the response phase on what to do if, God forbid, it does occur. Uh, what, what we still don't see uh, nearly enough of is educating uh, employees and personnel, volunteers even, uh, what to look for from a behavior point of view. So where we educate folks and we're, we're doing a better job, even though there's a still a long ways to go on the response phase, uh, there's still a lot of opportunities for improvement on the prevention phase uh, uh, from a behavior recognition point, point of view as well. Okay. And uh, I'd like to call out a comment from uh, uh, David Apple, Appel. Uh, it says 80% of all communication is nonverbal. Um, any, any, thank you, David. And any thoughts about how that relates to what we're talking about here? Absolutely. And, uh, and, and there's, we, we, we say pay attention to that spidey sense. And uh, like David says, uh, measuring people's body language w without them even saying a word, we can look for signs uh, that a person is, is uh, either aggressive or they're escalating their behavior. Maybe you see f a clenched fist, fist uh, they're pursing their lips. Uh, we see veiled threats uh, by somebody maybe doing this number without saying a word. They're making a slash across the throat. So, yeah, David's absolutely right. Uh, we want to focus on those nonverbal behavior indicators as well. Uh, Vaughn, this is related. Um, you know, a, an article that we posted on the Stratagos Facebook page uh, this week had to do uh, with a lawsuit from a city employee. Um, she had been an employee in a city government in Georgia for 20 years. And at one point, uh, she made a few statements to a coworker uh, about her dis dissatisfaction with her employment situation. And she said something to the effect of, it would be better that I, uh, that I quit than that I bring a gun in here. And uh, the coworker uh, kind of chuckled nervously and then later reported the comment. And the woman who made the statement was terminated. Um, the leader of the city said, there's a zero tolerance uh, policy here and she's suing to be uh, reinstated to her position. Um, you know, uh, others came to her defense and said, well, you know, she's a woman of integrity. She's never done anything wrong. She doesn't even own a gun. Um, what is someone, not, not necessarily only asking you to judge this specific incidence, but uh, are these something like this? Is that an obvious warning sign or when do we know when to just say, oh, that's just Susie? Well, and the, the what nat naturally happens in many cases incorrectly is that that latter part of your statement is what happens where they say, oh, they were just joking or the the uh, the threat was so shocking that they had to be joking. It would be one of the th things that we hear sometimes in that particular case. I do agree with their decision. Uh, the days of being able to to make a joke about bringing a gun to work. And then on the backside of it, say, I was just joking. Those days are over. It's like being in the line at the airport and threatening, making a joke about carrying a bomb on board. That's just something you don't do anymore. And right. uh, people, people are already anxious about this topic enough. And uh, you just don't get to say, oh, I was just joking on the backside of an event. So I do agree with their, their no tolerance uh, point of view. Now, on the other hand, that, that no tolerance point of view can be taken to the extreme. Uh, I've seen where uh, we have elementary age kids that are using their fingers at pointing as a gun or I heard one story where they shaped a piece of cheese that was on their lunch tray in the shape of a gun and they were looking at expel expulsion. And I, th I think that's uh, way overdone uh, in, in those cases. So it's all about context. And in this particular uh, situation, we do encourage uh, workplace organizations to have an, a no tolerance approach uh, related to context when people are making that threat. She was obviously being disciplined and she was actually looking at resigning. And then she says, well, before I bring a gun in here, uh, I better go ahead and resign. Well, obviously based on the discipline she was looking at, she, that was a threat that was at best case scenario, absolutely inappropriate. Worst case scenario uh, could have been a precursor 
to to uh, violence. So uh, they did, they did the right thing, in my opinion, on that situation. And it sounds like the the coworker who reported the comment, and I'm sure she did it reluctantly because they were friends. But it sounds like she did the right thing too. Absolutely, yeah. She she got got other people she's friends with there, and she cares about her own welfare. And uh, of course, if we can help someone uh, get help before they they uh, commit an act that they can never return from. Uh, we're actually helping that person as well. Uh, that even though they may lose their job, that's a lot better than a uh, best case scenario, going to prison for the rest of your life or worst case scenario, they may end up taking their life in the process. Well, thank you for your feedback and thank you for joining us. If you're watching either live or you're watching uh, later when uh, broadcast recirculates, uh, I'm Roy Harriman here with uh, Stratagos president, Vaughn Baker. And we're talking about workplace violence, uh, preventing and prevailing over workplace violence. We welcome your comments, uh, questions that you have. And if you uh, benefit from the information shared uh, that's shared here, we encourage you to share it on Facebook. So we thank you for being a part of our discussion today. Uh, you know, Vaughn, one thing uh, that's, uh, one concept that's commonly thrown out uh, when it comes to workplace violence is that someone uh, just uh, snaps um, and, and there was no notice, there was no warning. Uh, in preparing for this, I found uh, that uh, information from the U.S. Secret Service that in workplace violence incidents that they reviewed, uh, three out of the three out of four people who committed acts of workplace violence uh, displayed uh, what were referred to as troubling behaviors that were noticed by people in the workplace. Uh, two out of three uh, suffered uh, from at least a mild form of of mental illness, uh, which could include uh, paranoia and delusions. It, it sounds like no one really just snaps if we're paying attention. No, and I, I, I might even argue those percentages are higher than three out of four. Uh, almost always somebody's going to display body language or behavior indicators prior to a violent act, whether that's a few seconds or a few months. Uh, so uh, teach people what to look for is, is really important. Some of those that they talked about, the delusions, paranoia, the mental health issues, that's just one. Uh, we actually, when we do behavior assessments, we look for between 15 and 20 behavioral indicators, whether that's a uh, uh, their mindset in general, or that's actual behavior or statements that they make. Uh, we look at their uh, their past. Uh, do they have antisocial behavior in their past from a uh, uh, meaning criminal record? Uh, we look at their finances. We look uh, at their worldview in terms of uh, do they have a victim victimizer worldview? Uh, do they have a tough time taking uh, accepting responsibility for any of their failures? It's always somebody else's fault. Uh, have they made statements recently? Uh, illustrating that they have a fascination with weapons. Those are just a few of the, of the quite a few behavior indicators that we look at when we're doing behavior assessments. And so uh, we want to educate people on, on what to look for as well. Vaughn, what you're, you're talking about, being able to um, understand a problem and, and detect it, just as we, we discussed just a few moments ago regarding the city employee who, uh, you know, apparently joked about bringing a gun in. And, when it comes to the idea of observing observing behavior and trying to attribute whether it's troubling or not, is this something that the average you know lay person, office manager, coworker, human resources person is, is equipped to do? Can you do it yourself, or do you need uh, some training um, from organizations like Stratagos? Well, there's there's a part of it that's built into each one of us, and and again, it's that spidey sense is is the behavior that you're seeing concerning to you most. Is that inner alarm inside of you kicking off? Uh, now, the difference between that situation and somebody who's trained is now the person who's trained can actually articulate uh, objectively what is concerning them based on the 15 to 20 uh, behavior indicators that we, we talk about versus, uh, well, it just gave me a bad feeling. That's, that's kind of a subjective uh, articulation, and it's harder to take action on subjective versus objective. So. Uh, we we want to educate folks on that. Now, from the liability piece, any organization, what they need to be able to demonstrate, and again, prevention is not the expectation. We can't prevent every single instance. Uh, but we, on the backside of any crisis, we need to be able to demonstrate what we call a due diligence preparedness for that particular crisis. And what that means is we need to be able to demonstrate that we took reasonable effort to prevent harm to others uh, for that particular topic or that particular crisis uh, that has occurred. That's where we're, we're uh, talking about liability, uh, that we, uh, we were able to demonstrate that post-event. Great information. And again, if you're joining us now, we thank you for joining us for Stratagos Security Week. And our topic is workplace violence. And I'm talking with 
uh, Vaughn Baker, president of Stratagos International. Um, Vaughn, as we wind down here, I want you to be able to share any, any comments you have, any topics we haven't covered. Uh, one thing I would like to ask is, uh, it can seem if you are behind the eight ball with this, uh, whether you're a school or a church or a business, um, that it's just overwhelming. Uh, what are some simple uh, steps that organizations can take right away to uh, begin to uh, set themselves up for success in, in creating a, a culture that strives to prevent workplace violence? Well, and, and it is, it, we don't want to focus on one particular strategy. We, one of the things we say frequently is where hardware meets software, hardware being the technology, being the physical security uh, strategies versus the software, which is the training and training folks. Uh, one of the things we also say is, is uh, the single biggest step you can take to increasing safety and security at your place of uh, work or your organization where you find yourself is the uh, train, a trained employee. That's the single biggest step. So we would really encourage people if you're gonna if you're gonna uh, default to one or the other more than the other that we focus on the training piece and, and educating folks what to look for on the prevention phase from a behavior point of view and then how to effectively respond based on the current trends and attacks that have taken place uh, recently. Vaughn, what are some longer term solutions that organizations need to think about implementing? Well, as far as workplace violence education, or well, not only foundationally when an organization decides they want to really take the next level, uh, but also uh, recertification, retraining, and continue to educate folks. Now, and not, not only the people that have been there a while, but after we do our foundational training, you need to have a plan for how you're going to train new hires uh, that, as you onboard folks as well. Uh, the other, providing assistance for employees that are going through tough times uh, personal problems and and uh, they need help. Maybe we look into as a benefit to our employees an employee assistance program of some sort that provides mental health counseling, provides financial counseling if they're under financial duress for one reason or another. So looking at those strategies as well uh, would be some of the longer term steps that we would recommend. Yeah, it sounds like anything that employees employers can do to make uh, the workplace uh, feel like a safe place for maybe someone who's you know troubled or or you know on the edge. Everybody wins. Yeah, and what we're really talking about there, and especially when you're talking about training folks, uh, most of what we train folks to do applies not, to them not only when they're at work, but anywhere they're at. So you're actually demonstrating care for your employees by giving them strategies for safety and security, even when they're not at work. And if you cue that up to them, let them know, hey, we care about you when you're not here. We want to provide you assistance uh, to help you when you're off duty because you're going to be a better employee uh, if your morale's better. And if you've, uh, we can help mitigate some of these problems you're going through so uh, that they, they can uh, demonstrate that by training their employees. Yeah, and that's, that has to be a huge leap forward for a lot of companies because um, for many people, I mean, even if it's a, a great business, a successful business, uh, work is the last place that they would think to go to share some kind of a personal problem that's, uh, effect, that's uh, you know, affecting them, affect their work and cause some kind of great disturbance. So. Absolutely. Well, as we wind down this conversation on preventing and prevailing over workplace violence, uh, what are some, any final thoughts that you may have? And again, if you're watching, we welcome any questions or comments. Yeah, if anybody's got any questions, we'd be happy to, to answer them for you. Uh, just want to let uh, the folks that are viewing this video know that we're committed to continuing to learn about this topic. Uh, it seems like every week we learn uh, that either as, as trends change uh, from attacks that are taking place, we study almost every single attack that occurs. We look at and see how what we already know applies to that attack and then what we'd learn new. I'll give you an example of that uh, the Las Vegas massacre was a paradigm shift in a few cases. We still don't know what motivated that attacker, but he kind of broke uh, the profile, uh, the behavior profile of many of these attackers, these traditional attackers. Uh, most of the traditional attackers, they, they have a desire to share the personal space of the victim at the time of the death. He did not have that issue. He, uh, he was willing to kill at distance. And, uh, and, and we don't know, but that could be an indicator that he was an ideological attacker instead of, instead of uh, a traditional attacker. So we, we're just absolutely committed to this topic and we want to continue to learn and we want to encourage people to share uh, when they become aware of an incident that we can learn from as well. So we very much would appreciate that. Yes, for, for people who are looking to uh, to prevail, Stratagos is a, a great resource. And uh, you can visit our, our website, which I will be sure to uh, put on the screen here. 
right now. And uh, we have a wealth of resources, uh, videos, blog posts about this topic. It's a great place to start. And of course, you can let us know if you have additional questions. Uh, well, we thank everyone for joining us today. And again, if you have benefited from this, we encourage you to share it with others so that they can get the benefit as well. And everyone have a fantastic week, Vaughn. Thanks for your comments here today. Thank you. Thank you for everyone that joined us today and uh, appreciate your time. I know it's valuable. Thank you.